All right, Colossians chapter 1. <laughs> Let's bow for a word of prayer before we begin. Dear God, we thank you for the blessing of this day, for the opportunity that we have to assemble, to open your word, to study from it. We pray that we will gain knowledge and understanding of your will. We pray that we will apply that in our lives, that we may be pleasing to you, that we may draw closer to you. Help us to be effective in serving you, in advancing your kingdom and your cause, and helping to save souls. We pray that you will bless us in our assembly this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <coughs> All right, Colossians. Just a little bit of background on this. Where is Paul when he's writing this letter? Prison. Prison. Prison where? In Rome. Okay, does anybody know where Colossae is located? Or was located, maybe I should say. Okay. Yeah, Asia Minor. So Asia Minor is what area today? Turkey. Yeah, in Turkey. So he's over in Rome and Italy in prison, and he's writing a letter to a church over in Turkey or in Asia Minor. Um, written around 62 to 64 AD, around the same time as both Ephesians and Philippians were written that we just finished studying. Um, and one of the things it shows us is... As Paul is in prison in Rome, he's essentially under house arrest, but he continues to serve the Lord, continues to labor in the gospel. And it tells us that we can serve God under all circumstances. It doesn't matter where we are, what we're doing necessarily, what types of things are going on in our lives around us. We can still serve God, we can serve Him faithfully and advance the cause, we can be a source of encouragement to others. Um, let's just go ahead and jump right into it, Colossians 1, verses 1 through 8. Who can we get to read that for us? Colossians 1, 1 through 8. Go ahead, Ron. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you've heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which has come to you as it has also in all the world and is bringing forth fruit, as it is also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. As you also learn from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, who also declared to us your love in the Spirit. Okay. So, question number one. I asked, note how many times each of the following are mentioned in the first eight verses, and is there anything significant in this? So let's just step through some of these. How many times did you count Father being mentioned? Of course, I'm using the New King James, so there, there may actually be a slight difference, but so you've got two. Anybody else have a different number? I got three. Three, you include the end of chapter, end of verse six. Okay, yeah. Um, how many times about the sun? Okay, you got one count of six. Uh, Holy Spirit? Anybody? Okay, one. Gospel? One prayer? You got two? All right, brethren, two, grace, two is what I got, faith once. 
Um, what I want to get at here is we need to have our focus on God and the truth because it mentions the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit nine times in eight verses. So Paul is directing our mind toward the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit to be mindful of that, as, of course, you would expect. But to focus on God and His truth and serving one another, our dependence on God, that's part of what he's weaving into this here. It's just something that you might know as you go through reading the New Testament, how those things are constantly intertwined in the message that is given to us. So Paul greets them with a blessing <clears throat> as he's writing to them, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That peace that only comes through grace. He's wishing that on them and for them and of course it comes through a relationship with the Father and with the Son and cannot be found any other place. Now he says there at the beginning of verse 2 to the saints and what? Faithful brothers in Christ. Okay, faithful brothers, faithful brethren in Christ. Why would he mention saints and faithful brethren? Is there anything maybe that that would imply or not all saints are faithful okay not all saints are faithful to the faithful brethren okay so when you read on through this letter you understand that there are false teachers at work among the Colossians and there are some who are being persuaded by them and Paul is very subtly here saying look I'm writing this to all the saints, but especially the faithful brethren at Colossae. And you need to have this strength that he's going to give them throughout the letter. <clears throat> so he goes on to thank God for his brethren. We give thanks in verse 3 to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And what is he doing for them? Praying always. Hey, okay, praying always. Uh, does that mean every minute of every day he's praying to God on behalf of the Colossians? What does it mean? Praying always for you. Do you have it worded a different way, Ron? Well, I was going to say, it's like the difference between continuous and continual. Mm -hmm. Continuous is with <coughs> um, Continual means that there may be interruptions, but you're consistently doing it. Right, right. Just like he writes over in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, pray without ceasing. He's not saying your entire life and entire communication every waking moment is prayer. We, we realize that's, that's not the case. He's just saying you do it habitually again and again over and over daily in your life, maybe multiple times a day in your life, you're going to God in prayer. You, you need to have that as just a part of your being. And Paul is saying, I am constantly going to God in prayer for you. And what does he say in verse uh, 4 there? Since he heard of their faith. So what does that tell you about Paul and his relationship to the brethren at Colossae? that's different than his relationship at Ephesus or... Not like he's got a close personal relationship with him. He's just hearing of their... Okay, he's hearing of their faith. So what does that mean? Someone near him is bringing the message to him, I guess. Okay. Possibly the saints of Rome or those who travel back and forth since they're and really not that far away in the scheme of things. Yeah, and he, he goes on to mention Epaphras here a little bit. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it, it shows that they had an active work. <laughs> People hear about active works. Mm -hmm. They don't hear about dormant groups. Generally not, unless it's really, really bad. bad. <laughs> and, then, <Yes. laughs> and then you do... Um, but yeah, I, I, point taken. This is These brethren are active, engaged, zealous in the cause. And he says, I've, I've heard of that. But one of the points is, he's not been there. He hasn't met these brethren. Clint. He passed through kind of the middle section of Turkey, and, and Colossae is just kind of 
just a little bit south of that middle portion. But he went through Laodicea, and Laodicean Colossae are super close. Right. So he would have, he would have known of them, <coughs> heard of them. Maybe he met some of the brethren. You know, I, I don't know. But well, when he went through, he was establishing churches going through. And you can see establishing a work at Laodicea, and he goes on, he continues in his work, and brethren at Laodicea helped to start a work at Colossae. And you can see how that gospel spread, just like, you know, when he writes a letter to the churches of Galatia, uh, it's talking about churches that are spread throughout that area. So the, these works have been planted, and they are fruitful, and they are growing, and it says that he heard about them. And here's what I, I want us to think about that we do hear about other works. We hear about other congregations through our connections, through our relationships, and we need to rejoice in that because there are few people who are interested in the truth and even fewer who accept the truth. We, there's a rare breed, if you will, of people who are truly committed to the Lord. And we need to appreciate that. We need to be praying for them and thanking God for them and for their work in the kingdom. So he says of them that he's heard of their faith and of what else in verse 4? Love. And love for all the saints because of what? Verse 5. Dave, what is the hope laid up in heaven? Eternal salvation. Yeah, eternal salvation, that crown of life. They, in other words, he's saying you've got your focus where it needs to be and these are things that you're doing. You have that faith, that, that hope, that love, which by the way, those three appear quite often in the New Testament together, faith, hope, and love. And he's saying that they have this here and they're looking forward to that home in heaven. And they've helped to spread the gospel uh, and he talks about the fact that this gospel, this word of truth, which the gospel is truth, it contains truth, that that has come not only to them at Colossae, but where else has it gone, verse 6? Into all the world. Yeah, into all the world. How could that happen in the first century? I mean, they were backward, weren't they? Okay, each one tell one. News spreads, right? Even in the ancient world, we... I think we stand in a position of arrogance and ignorance thinking that we have somehow invented worldwide communication. <laughs> we haven't. It's just, it's just a different form of it. And it may be quicker, granted, but still in ancient times they were able to spread news and news spread rapidly, especially in the Roman Empire as they had that means of communication. It goes back much further than that even in ancient history. but. He's, he's saying that gospel is spread and it's gone throughout the world and people have heard it just like they had heard it. And so he talks about them, verse 6, it's bringing forth fruit as it also is among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. What's that idea of fruit? How is fruit born? In the, go ahead, Ron. Well, in the context of God's word, every seed brings forth after its own kind. So it begins with the seed. And we see the cause and effect relationship in the previous verse. The hope is the result of the gospel. That's the cause and effect. The gospel is the cause. The hope is the effect. And the fruit is the result of those things working together. Right. Exactly right. In order to get a seed, you have to plant and water. Right? Clint. Another thing is to get fruit. You have to have a mature plant. Or a mature tree. You don't plant the seed sprouts and then you get fruit. It doesn't work that way. Right. It has to be nurtured, it has to be watered, it has to be trained, it has to be <coughs> mature. As you're talking, Stephen, and how the word reached all the world, you know, we see that with Philip and how the Spirit took him. And God put people where he wanted them, as Paul said at the very beginning, it was the will of God that he was writing and doing these things. So as you're describing it, it's working all together, isn't it? Right. 
in his providence, he worked out for that gospel to be spread throughout the world. And, you know, some people have a problem with the idea that that gospel had gone throughout the world in the first century. But again, if you go back, you study, you read ancient history, you're going to see and understand they communicated rather regularly and how that these things would spread. And, and the New Testament lays out itself about how that gospel being spread. I mean, it got to Africa very quickly through Philip teaching the Ethiopian who went down and he, no doubt, in fact, some of the uh, archaeological evidence says that Christianity reached Ethiopia very, very early on. They can trace that back really early. But being that, be that as it may, you have fruit being born because a seed had been planted and watered. The same seed is what we have today and it can still bear fruit and does still bear fruit today bearing fruit in the kingdom so jumping on down a little bit it talks about that he learned this in verse 7 from Epaphras our dear fellow servant so Epaphras evidently was from Colossae he had made his way to Rome and he had helped out Paul um, being either a representative on behalf of Colossae or being sent out by Colossae in some way, but he was a part of those, a part of that work, and now in Rome, and he brought news to Paul uh, of what was happening there and of that work. So anything else through verse 8? All right, let's read verses 9 through 18, please. A little bit longer reading, but Colossians 1, 9 through 18, who will grab that? Go ahead, Clint. And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. May you be strengthened with all power, according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption for the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things are created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. Okay. So generally speaking, what is Paul praying for on behalf of the Colossians? When he says, you may be filled with knowledge. You may have wisdom and spiritual understanding, walk worthy, fully pleasing, fruitful in every good work, increasing, strengthened. What's another way to put all those? Is there some way to sum all that up? Spiritual growth. He's praying for their spiritual growth, exactly right. So Paul in Rome is praying for the spiritual growth of these brethren over in Colossae. So my question is, are we praying for the spiritual growth of this church? Is that something that is regularly in your prayers? That this church will increase in knowledge and understanding, in wisdom, being strengthened in the Lord. We need to be praying about that. Question number two, for what did Paul pray regarding the Colossians and falling on down? And, and what I want on this is more specific things. So he prays for what? What are some of the things he specifically mentions there? knowledge of God's will, spiritual wisdom, understanding. Okay, so what does that have to do with, or how how might we see that as an advantage, and how would they do that? Uh, I imagine that as kind of grasping the truth, right? Holding on to what the will of God is through letters such as the one that they have here. Um, we know from the end of the chapter that, you know, I think they're supposed to pass around letters, right? So it's not only just this one, but they, they may have the Ephesian letter and the Galatian letter, or that there's a Laodicean letter too, but uh, yeah, that one's well, included in the New Testament. And the Laodicean letter may actually be 
what we know as Ephesians or Galatians. <laughs> and so, yeah, that's one of those things. But yes, they did not have the complete truth in their possession at this time. Remember, the New Testament, these letters being written were things that came over a period of time. Now, they had the Holy Spirit and spiritual gifts that they could teach and there could be a revelation of knowledge, but they, they are growing in this knowledge. And the reality is we're all growing in the knowledge of the Lord. We, even though we have the completed covenant of Christ, we have the completed testament that's been passed down to us, we still need to read it, to gain understanding, to have deeper insight into it, Mike. Well, just imagine if we only had a few of the letters and how much time we would be spending on thinking about those few things. And we have, the, as you pointed out, the complete work. So we have sometimes kind of slow down. I know that you've said this a couple of times about reading through the scriptures very quickly mm -hmm. to get the overview, but understand right. that you've got to take the time to digest some of that stuff. Right. Exactly right. And that's what he's wanting them to do, to continue on that path to know the will of God. That Notice how he says that you may walk worthy and be fully pleasing to him, being fruitful in every good word and so on. So he's praying for their continued maturity in Christ. Um, any other thoughts there? Uh, I'm, I don't know that the order is specific to anything in this, but it, it's interesting to me that he starts with knowledge. Knowing is not doing. Knowing is knowing. Mm -hmm. And then he goes on to understanding and walking. Mm -hmm. And that's the application of the very first the very first thing there. You can know something and still not do it. Right. Right. Exactly right. Yeah. So... He talks about this, sort of this progress that they have in being strengthened and having patience and long-suffering. Why would they need patience and long-suffering? Isn't being a Christian just, you know, a joy and easy and smooth path all the way? Not only us now have to have that patience, but those at that time were still working against a lot of the preconceptions of false gods and all of those kind of things, I guess. Okay, any... Sorry, Rick, go ahead. Okay. Sorry. Any other thoughts? Chris? Patience and long suffering will also give you a better understanding as long as you continue to apply yourself. That way the fruits will continue to be done. Um, okay, I'm going to show just maybe a little bit of my ignorance, but anybody here been a farmer? Anybody have a garden? Go ahead. Yeah, I grew up on a farm. Yeah. Everything takes patience. Okay. Everything. To, yeah, between animals or crops mm -hmm. and planting, getting out in the heat, the cold, harvesting, you know, the dust, the dirt. You know, all those things. That that takes hard work. It takes commitment. And he's using this language through here about bearing fruit, being fruitful. Works. Works. Those are things that take patience. And generally long suffering, because there are times when you're working on anything that it's going to cause you to have some suffering. Let, let me ask you this. How would you like it as a farmer or a gardener, if you have a garden, and you're going along and you're planting seed in the ground, and five minutes later somebody else has come along and picking that seed out of the ground? <laughs> the birds. <laughs> okay, the, and even the birds may do it. But what if there was somebody who was specifically determined that you were not going to get that seed in the ground. And it wasn't going to take root. Right? That's what the devil's doing. That's what people will do. We try to teach people the truth, and there will be somebody to come along and try to get that out. 
try to uproot it. And so that takes patience and long suffering. There are people who try to get it out of us, try to convince us that what the truth is, is not the truth. So we have to have patience and long suffering. We have to be well grounded in the knowledge and the wisdom of God to fight against that, to resist that, so that we can be fully pleasing in His sight. Any other thoughts there? Stephen, as you mentioned previously, and, and what he's talking about here is in good works, and God has defined what good works, and as you were teaching in one other lesson, people are redefining what is good today, which is another working of Satan, you know, mm -hmm. and, and what we see taking effect, you know, more presently in our own nation. That mm -hmm. leads to only further corruption and, and more um, apathy towards God's word and, and his ways. Yes, yes, exactly right. So, being a Christian, there's a challenge. It's a difficult path. It's the greatest challenge that man will ever face because it requires us to bring ourselves into submission to God, to set our will aside and let His will govern in our lives. And the culture and society and Satan are pushing completely against that. So we have to understand it requires discipline and dedication. Mike? Well, they're busy with their own fruit. They're trying to produce their own fruit. And we have to understand that. I mean, you know, that they are very active in, you know, planting their own seed, seeing their own fruit come out in mm -hmm. later times. I mean, so mm -hmm. if, if they're putting that much effort towards it, we cannot just sit back and complain about their effort that they're putting into it. We have to put more effort into what we're doing. Right. In fact, in this very letter, he deals with people who are planting a different seed. <laughs> yeah, very good. All right, so verses 13 and 14 then, and it goes with question number three. How are we conveyed from darkness into the kingdom? I ask you to cite scripture. Verse 1, Acts 2. Acts 2? 38. 38, which says what? Uh, repent and be baptized. Repent and let everyone be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Uh huh. Then verse 47. Verse the Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. Uh, we go from the power of darkness into the kingdom of light. What, what does the power of darkness convey to you? Because he says this is a reality. Power of, if you have the power of darkness and the kingdom of light, could we switch those up and say the kingdom of darkness and the power of light? Is there a kingdom of darkness? Most certainly there is. Who's king in the kingdom of darkness? Satan is. Right? And there is the power of light, the power of the gospel, the kingdom of light. Right? So... He's saying you go from one to the other. You go from being under the persuasion of Satan to being under the persuasion of God, the leadership of the devil to the leadership of the Lord. Mike, do you have something? Yeah. <clears throat> I don't know. I guess I've always kind of seen it this way when he says the domain of darkness and then, or the power of darkness in the kingdom of light, that a domain is just kind of there. But a kingdom has structure to it. And I guess that's how I've seen it. And I don't know why it shows the two different words. But um, you know, I guess in my mind, there's a big difference between just kind of stumbling around in darkness and not having any, any, any reason or purpose in life. And then you come to a kingdom. Now you have a reason and you have a purpose that God's going to be placed for you. Okay. I have exactly these two points in my notes here. We can live for the devil accidentally but you have to live for God on purpose. So he's pointing out to them they've been transferred. It's because they accepted the truth as he's already praised them for doing. You've heard this truth. You accepted it. It's born fruit. And so they've been conveyed from darkness to light. Now, when he says that they've been delivered into the kingdom of the Son, what do we know for sure about the kingdom at that time, Mike? It existed. Yeah, it existed. 
right? Because there are a lot of people who think the kingdom is still future to us, that it has yet to be established. But here very clearly he says they were in the kingdom of the son of his love. The kingdom of God is another way to put that. Uh, the church of Christ, all these things would be conveyed in that. So they are in the kingdom. Now question number four I ask, select one description attributed to Christ Verses 15 to 18 briefly discuss its truth and maybe how it contradicts what some believe about Jesus. He is the image of what? Mike? I think the word firstborn shows up quite a bit there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that, that term um, in some religions is misused is to say that he was actually created. Mm -hmm. And that is not how that, that term firstborn is being used. As a matter of fact, <laughs> it continues on, he says he was made the firstborn of all these different things so that he could have preeminence in all these things. And there are other places, um, such as in uh, Psalm chapter 89, verses 20 through 27, where it talks about David being the firstborn of all kings and how God was going to make him the firstborn of all kings. Well, that doesn't mean he's the firstborn born but he was holding him to a higher to a higher position. He was the preeminent king of all the kings of the earth. And that's the same thing that's being stated here for us in Colossians, is that he is the firstborn, the preeminent one, the one that is the most important of all in, in creation. Right. That firstborn is only talking about position of rank, authority, inheritance, because the firstborn would be the one that would get the double portion. The firstborn would be the one that would take over as the patriarch of the family and, and things like that. And that's, that's that concept that's being conveyed to us here. So, yeah, exactly right. Because uh, there are some who say firstborn that Jesus was a created being. And he was not a created being because he made all things. It's eternal. Exactly right. Any other thoughts there? Clint. Kind of going along with the same lines that we learned from John 1, which we just talked about in the Wednesday night class, was that he's talked about as the almost like the executor of creation. Here he's talked about that too. You know, I'm sure God, the Father, and the Spirit, they were all there together doing the creation, but it really seems like that Jesus is the executor of that. That was like his job was to do it. Okay. So this is one of the beautiful things about the plan of salvation and creation that parallel each other. God the Father is the architect. Christ the Son brought it into reality. The Holy Spirit completed it or finished it off. So God the Father, the architect of the universe. God the Son, the Bible talks about. He's the one that actually brought it into existence. The Holy Spirit hovering on the face of the waters after the earth, after after the creation there of the earth. And so you see those roles. You see God the Father is the architect of the plan of salvation. It's His plan from eternity. The Son's the one who came and executed it, brought it into reality. And then the Holy Spirit came and finished it off, completed it with the revelation of full truth. Mike, do you have some? Yeah, I was going to say also, if you look at kind of the whole thought, when He talks about Him rescuing us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom, of his beloved son. So the beloved son is over that kingdom is what he states here. And then also, in, as he finishes the thought in verse 18, he says, he is also the head of the body of the church. So he uses those two terms interchangeably in, right here in just one thought. Exactly, exactly. He rounds that out very well there. So it says he's the, invisible, or the image of the invisible God. Where else is that talked about? Does anybody have a... Scripture reference? How about Hebrews 1 3? Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. What do we have there? In fact, let's just get Hebrews 1 1 through 4. Hebrews 1 1 through 4, Rick. All of God's servant of God. Hebrews. One. I know that. Were you in Hebrews? 
Go ahead. God, who at various times and in various ways spoken, time passed to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through him, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty of the night, having become so much better than the angels, as he had, has an, by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. You know, we, we really could use Hebrews 1, the entire chapter, as commentary on this section in Colossians because it's, it goes into more detail, but it complements it. But be that as it may, um, it talks about that he is the image of the invisible God. The uh, Hebrew writer talks about like he's the impress or the imprint. So, you know, uh, the ancient seals that would go into wax, it would be like you would see exactly what God is like. And what, he, what the idea is that Jesus on earth revealed to us what God is in heaven, gave us a, a living concrete example that this is how God would behave in this world, what he would do. So we have that in Christ. And it says that he created all things that are visible and invisible. So what are the visible things? What are some of the visible things? Trees, mountains, the matter we see around us. Trees, mountains, yeah, oceans, planets, stars, all those things. What's the invisible things? Atoms, viruses, bacteria. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. I've, I've got down x-rays, right? Gravity. Who's ever seen gravity? See nope. what it does. I, yeah, you can see the effects of gravity. I asked one guy one time, he was, he was trying to tell me he understood all things, right? I was like, do you understand gravity? He was like, yeah. I'm, okay, he's lying. I, there's, <laughs> nobody understands gravity. Nobody does. They, they can't explain it. They can't figure it out. They don't know where it comes from, why it's there. What does the Bible say? We're held in place by the power of God's Word. By His power in Hebrews chapter 1. It's the power of His Word that holds all things. By Him, as it says here, all things consist. The only way the universe keeps going along is by the power of Christ. That's it. And that completely refutes the idea that God put everything in place and then just... Just, just let it go. Yeah. Right, exactly, Mike. Well, just the invisible thing like consciousness. Mm -hmm. I mean, we live in a universe of atoms and matter and non-living things, but yet we have consciousness introduced into the universe. How is that even possible? Love, joy, fear. <laughs> Atheists cannot explain these things. Cannot. But the Bible gives the answer to us because we've been made in the image of God and it is God who holds all things together, specifically Jesus Christ. Now, why does it say these things were made? Verse 16, the end, and into verse 17. Why were they made? Through him and for him. Through him and for him. It's for his glory or his honor. We need a greater appreciation for the one who gave himself for us. He brought all of this into existence. The things we can see, the things we can't see. That's who our Savior is. That's who our Master is. And he rules the universe today. He's our advocate. He's our judge. We need to appreciate that and honor Him, revere Him in our lives. So it says that He's the firstborn from the dead. What does that mean? Was He the first one to ever be resurrected from the dead? No, He wasn't. There have been many resurrected from the dead before Christ came from the dead, but what's the difference? He, never, he was re resurrected but never died. Okay, resurrected and... He never suffered. 
Yeah, he ascended into heaven. Right? All the others who were ever resurrected, they, they lived out a, a normal life to whatever degree it was, and they ended up dying. Clint, and then Mike. There was an external force that raised Lazarus. An external force that raised the widow's son. But Jesus raised himself, mm -hmm. the firstborn, because he did it by his own power. Father has given me power to lay it down, power to take it again. No one takes it from me. He laid it down. Let's always remember on the cross. I mean, today the world is finally remembering or giving some preeminence to the sacrifice of Christ. It, it wasn't the nails or the loss of blood or anything like that that caused his death. He laid his life down. He gave it up. And then he took it back. That's why we believe in him as a Savior. Right? So good point on that. Um, now, again, going back to something Mike said, you, th you think about this one created all things visible and invisible, thrones, dominions, principalities, powers. He, he created this through him, for him. He is before all things. In him all things consist. He's the head of the body of the church. Talked about being over the kingdom. If we disrespect the church, we disrespect the kingdom, that means we dis disrespect Christ and the head of the church. So we need to have a deep and abiding respect. Not only was our salvation bought by the blood of Christ, but also the church. Yes. Yes, exactly. The church being purchased by His blood. All right, let's read 19 to 23, please. Who will grab that for us? Colossians 1, 19 to 23. Ashley. All right, so we can realize eternal redemption through Christ and only through Christ. He's uniquely qualified. It says it pleased the Father that in Him all the fullness should dwell. What's the idea of all the fullness dwelling in Him? Uh, the concept that the entire plan is fulfilled by him from before the beginning of time until the final judgment. It's all completed through him. It is all completed through him. Any other thoughts there? So the, the son is the sacrifice for the sins of the world and by him to reconcile all things to himself. Question number five I asked, what were we once and what are we now and why? So, as he goes on describing this, verse 21, what were we? Aliens and enemies are hostile and Yeah. Aliens and enemies. What's an alien? Outsider. Outsider. We were not in the kingdom. We were outside the kingdom. We were aliens. We had no rights, no privileges. What about enemies? What does that convey? Fighting against. Fighting against God. Yeah. We were fighting against Him in our previous life. Enemies in your mind by wicked works, but now you are reconciled. So if you're reconciled, what are you? Restored in harmony. Yeah, in harmony with Him. You're no longer an alien. You're no longer an enemy. You're a citizen of the kingdom. You are a friend of God. Mike. Well, all of those things that you, that you mentioned, we were hostile and we did engage in evil deeds, but we've been reconciled 
So therefore, all of those things that he just mentioned, we no longer engage in. Whether it be the deeds, whether it be hostile in mind, whatever it is, we've surrendered everything <coughs> over to our new kingdom, our new Lord. Exactly. Exactly. We've had a change in our life because of what he has done for us and willingly submitted to his will to govern our lives. And he did this. It talks about repeatedly here, having made peace through the blood of his cross in the body of his flesh, verse 22, through death. So it was through his sacrifice that this was made possible, not, not anything that we could do to justify ourselves in, in the sight of God, but what Christ did for us. But we had to accept that. We had to submit to his will. And to the end that, verse 22, what's going to happen? What's his end goal with us? Persons blameless, without reproach, holy. Exactly. That's where we need to keep our mind. As he talked about earlier, them having that hope. That's that idea there, that we would be blameless and without reproach or above reproach in his sight, that we would have that home in heaven when the Lord returns. Now, verse 23 and question number 6, what are you doing to remain grounded and steadfast? And that's more of a personal reflection, but what are things we could do to be grounded and steadfast? Speaking to the saying that you know you're doing evil deeds, the contrast of that would be good works, right? So you know, using the Bible as its own commentary, you take the contrast of what you see there, and it's good works. It's doing reading, studying the Word, familiarizing yourself more with the knowledge of His will. Going back to that previous list of things that Paul talked about, for the bosses said he prays for that. But they did this. Right. Now notice that he says, you'll be holy, blameless, and above reproach in his sight. Verse 23, what? Yes. Yes. If you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast. If you continue. So people can depart, and that means they're not holy and blameless and without reproach. They are unholy, they are to be blamed, they are guilty, and they have reproach and bring reproach. Clint, Mike, then Chris. So, uh, we've got that very common doctrine of once saved, always saved. And this flies in the face of that right now as we're reading it. Right. You were once outside an enemy, now you're holy and blameless, but you can backslide. And you can lose all that, and you can be a reproach to God. Again, like you had been before. And so, you know, as you're reading that, and if you have an open and honest heart about that, you can see that just because I'm saved once doesn't mean I'm always saved. Exactly, Mike. Well, I was going to say also that we as Christians need to understand because we say, you know, Christ came here to live as an example for us. And moving that example out of concept into actuality and us actually following that example in how we treat others, how we treat our families, how we um, treat our respect to God, and all of those things, we have to live that example also. Yes. Chris? Well, we know that the longer that we spend away from God's Word and not doing His will and doing His work, we're consumed by the world around us. So it just makes us weaker, so if we constantly stay grounded, stay in His Word, and continue to do His works, then we will be above all the rest. Christianity is a lifelong commitment that requires discipline, pushing yourself to grow in the Lord and serving in His kingdom, and sacrificing for His cause. Rick, last word. Go, go back to verse 10. That you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him, being fruitful in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God. So, walking and continuing in the faith, same thing. Right. I mean, you can't walk pleasing to God without continuing. 
Exactly. Exactly right. All right, thank you all very much. Lord willing, we'll pick up in verse 24, rapidly move on into chapter 2 next week.